This is like one of those days in school where you do what I did on my summer holidays. On my summer holidays, I went to a Cranog and it was burnt down. But I went in the lake and I didn't fall in the lake. And that is what I did. And there was a dog. If you don't know what a Cranog is, let's start with that. A Cranog is basically a house in a lake. And if you remember from The Hobbit, Lake Town is built basically on stilts in a lake. And that's effectively what a Cranog is, is it is a building, or several buildings sometimes, on stilts, built in the middle of a lake. Not in the middle of a lake, but into a lake. Some of them have a causeway, like a sort of pontoon going towards the house, also on stilts. Some of them don't have that, some of them can only be accessed by boat, and it just kind of depends on the design that you're going for and what you want to do with a Cranog in your specific area. There are literally hundreds of Cranogs, and there are hundreds of Cranogs in Scotland, there are hundreds of Cranogs in Ireland, there's one in Wales, uh, and it's at Sangors, but what we lack in quantity, we more than make up for in quality, because Sangors Cranog is amazing, and the finds that have come from it, the excavation results from Sangors Cranog have revealed some absolutely incredible and unique artefacts. We've got some wonderful fabric that is silk embroidered onto linen in imitation of Byzantine silk brocades. We think, and it is incredibly fine. We've got loads of jewellery, we've got loads of eating and drinking equipment and tools and knives and what have you, and we've got lots of amazing pieces of big woodwork from the actual Cranog itself. And the Cranog Centre in Scotland is a place where you can go to find out all about Cranogs and when they were built and how they were built. And the example that they have there is an Iron Age Cranog. So it's sort of 2,000 years old, two and a half thousand years old-ish. And they look at the entire history of Cranogs and they look at the artefacts they found there, they look at some of the other finds from the Cranogs, and it's an amazing day out and it's a fantastic centre. Cranogs are this amazing Iron Age development where people seem to have come up with the idea that they're going to build their house in a lake for whatever reason. There might be several reasons why you would want to build your house in a lake. It's easily defended, it is easy to get rid of poop and various other waste products, you just sling it into the water, uh, it doesn't use up lots of land that you could be using for farming and agriculture and forestry and whatever, um, grazing animals, and they're super cool, they involve a lot of effort, and it's a really good way of showing off how many people you have at your disposal or how much disposable income you have in Iron Age terms that you can build your house not just out of dirt on the on the soil but you build it on stilts in a lake like that's you know that's pretty baller the the cranogs at Loch Tay there were lots of cranogs at Loch Tay several of them I think more than a dozen just on this loch are all relatively similar in, similar in construction they're different to Sangors Cranog uh, they're not built up onto an island, they are just on platforms, on stilts in the water. I keep saying stilts, they're piles. They're pile-driven into the bed of the lakes that they're built in. A lot of the ones in Ireland are built that way as well. Sangors is actually built on an island. So there is already an island, an island in the lake, and they've built a Cranog onto the island, which is interesting, and a sort of a rarer way of building them because islands in lakes aren't that common. Some of the artefacts that they found there are truly amazing. They found uh, 20, 30 foot long piles made of just tree trunks that were driven into the seabed, basically, into the lake bed, and they tell you how they did it when you go to the Cranog Center. I'm not going to tell you everything because you'll find out why, and they have seeds from fruit, they have actual uh, sort of bits of plant material. Did you know Iron Age people in Scotland were eating cherries? I didn't know that. That's stuff that you learn when you go to museums. They have potentially musical instruments, they have cordage, they have like rope that people have made, they've got jewellery, and some of the jewellery is imported during the Iron Age, so like 
pre-Roman Iron Age imported jewellery from Southern Europe, which is just mind-blowing that those networks were in place. And they have evidence of boats. Log boats, coracles, curachs, and they have oars and paddles uh, from these vessels. And some of them seem like very small vessels that were being used. But we also know that during the Iron Age, large seagoing vessels were being made in the British Isles, which is really cool. The technology for these Cranogs and the way that they're built seems to come east from Ireland. Sort of a slightly rare eastward transmission of technology in the Iron Age. A lot of the time you expect things to transmit sort of north and west. And this seems to have just come east and slightly south in some cases as well. So it's really interesting that that seems to be where this has all come from. During the Roman occupation of Britain, they fall out of, of favour in terms of being built fresh, as it were. And you start seeing things like towns and villages and cities popping up, and then the Roman influence starts to spread, even beyond Hadrian's Wall, because yes, they got above Hadrian's Wall, and yes, they were above Hadrian's Wall for generations. Let's just... Bleh, that's a whole video in itself. So, Cranogs are used right the way through the Iron Age, right the way through the Roman occupation. They seem to get less favourable during and after the Roman period, but Sangors Cranog is definitely in use up to the end of the 10th century, maybe even the start of the 11th century. So these things are being used for a very long time. Some of these things are being used for potentially a thousand years. And a thousand years of occupation on effectively a wooden platform in a lake is incredible longevity. So that's a very long time for a wooden building surrounded by water to be occupied. That's really, really cool. I'm not an expert in Cranox. If you want to talk to experts in Cranogs, the best place to go to is the Scottish Cranog Centre. Unless you're in Ireland, in which case there are Irish Cranog Centres and Museums for the Cranogs in Ireland. But the Scottish Cranog Centre is amazing, and it's on the southern bank of Loch Tay, which is just up in the Highlands there. And you can get there really easily, you basically just drive up to Aviemore and turn left, and it's an amazing little museum. In June, a catastrophic fire destroyed an awful lot of the work there. They built a completely authentic Cranog. The Cranog itself was full-sized. You could fit 30, 40 people in there. And it was an absolutely magnificent building. And I'm really upset that I never got to go to it before it burnt down. It's a very sad sight now when you see it. You see the causeway that goes straight out into the loch. And then it's just blackened timbers and they've actually saved an awful lot of the piles and they're just piled up and they're all black and it's all really sad um, but yeah the Cranock Center was not destroyed so a lot of the newspapers reported that the center was destroyed the center the Cranock Center is perfectly fine it's completely untouched what burnt down was just that building what caused it well we don't know unfortunately this is something that does happen. Wooden buildings burn down, especially wooden buildings with thatched roofs. Especially wooden buildings with thatched roofs during an unseasonably hot period of weather, like the one we're having right now, because climate change stops sending billionaires to space in giant penis rockets. So it could have been an ember or a spark that flew up from the fire. They usually had a fire going in there uh, that may have just hit the roof smouldered away unnoticed for potentially days before a really dry period allowed it to spread more. Uh, it could have been the fire may have, have spat a spark out and hit a piece of dry wool or a piece of bedding or something and, the, and the, the, the whole place just went up. You don't want it to be vandalism. It could have been vandalism, of course. You, you know, one really, really, really hopes that nobody would burn down the Cranock because it's so cool and it brought so much to the area and, it, and local people love it there uh, and are really sad that it burnt down. It's a, it's a real tragedy to people there. So we don't know why it burnt down. But like I say, the archaeology of a burnt Cranock in the 21st century is really, really special because we don't have any burnt Cranogs to study from less than a thousand years ago. So it's really interesting, from an archaeological point of view, emotions aside, to see what we see and see what is on the floor, on the loch bed. It would be interesting to go down there and survey that, but 
bringing emotion back in. Oh my god, heartbreaking. My heart was was just aching when I saw it there. So sad. But I went there for their big annual The Celts Are Coming event. And The Celts Are Coming is this amazing festival that they have there of craftspeople. And basically you go there, you see the amazing pride flag because they are an awesome museum and they are very, very, very LGBTQ plus aware and friendly. Uh, you see their lovely garden full of herbs and authentic plants that they have there. You see the loch, it's sunny, and you go on a tour. And this tour is a fiver. It's five pounds for a grown adult to go on this tour. It lasts over an hour and it's so informative and so cool. I highly recommend that you go on it. So you go through the museum and the museum at the Cranog Centre has all of these artefacts and all of these things that they found in Loch Tay in the Cranogs. When you go outside, they've now made the fire part of the tour. So you sit down and you look at what used to be the Cranog and you just learn about the Cranog, the way it's built, and you can actually still get a load of the sort of feel and the vibe of what it was like just from the causeway being there. It's also really good that they have now been given permission, land and funding to start building new Cranogs, and I think they're going to build three new Cranogs. So it's going to look so much more like it did in the Iron Age, because it's not just going to be this one lonely building. It's going to be basically a village of Cranogs, which is what it would have looked like. It's going to be so cool. Um, so, on a personal note, so happy that they've got that funding, because it's going to be magic. It's going to be absolutely magic. I mean, it's already magic. Anyway, this weekend was amazing, because there were some of my reenactor friends were there. Dave was there. You guys remember Dave McGrath, who ran the 5K in Chainmail with me. Dave was up there for basically the entire weekend plus. I was only there for a day. It was so nice to see Dave. Uh, we have uh, Hamish was there from Pictavia Leather. And Hamish is an incredible craftsman. He makes amazing things out of animal skins. And if you guys are interested in some of the... Pictish and early medieval leatherwork that we've got. Hamish makes fantastic museum quality replicas of things like the water bottle, the giant water bottle that is now in the National Museum Ireland Archaeology in Dublin, or the bag, the leather satchel, the Cranog bag, as it's so called, because it was found on a Cranog site. We also had Christine and Sean, and Sean is a fellow Welshman. He is from uh, North Wales. He has a, a wonderful tattooing company where he uses uh, sort of Iron Age designs in his tattooing work and it just looks absolutely fantastic. And uh, he sang some amazing songs and you're hearing Christine and Sean right now. And uh, the big highlight of the whole thing for me was I went in a coracle for the first time since 2012. A coracle, if you don't know, is a small, basically bent wood boat. You take, uh, you take branches, willow branches, tree branches, you bend them, you weave a rim around the, the sort of the bottom of the boat, you weave a rim around it in more branches, and then you cover the hole in an animal skin. Usually a rawhide, traditionally it's just a rawhide. You cover it in a rawhide, and you got a boat, my friend. There's usually a plank in the middle for you to sit on, in modern ones. And this is a really old design of boat. It's not a seagoing craft, it's for going out into the loch and doing a bit of fishing, or pottering into the river, or crossing a small distance. Yeah, there's stories of things like, you know, Columbus sailing across in his coracle to Iona from the mainland, but pinch of salt about that big with stories like that. You can do pretty cool stuff in them. Somebody crossed the Thames in a coracle about 40 years ago, I think, which is awesome. Uh, but it took a very long time. As you can see, you don't build up a great deal of speed, even with two people paddling furiously. You do paddle them with one, incidentally, at the front, sort of doing a figure of eight, rather than sort of canoe style with that J-shaped either side paddling. Traditionally you paddle them with one paddle at the front. And these were things that you would see on the rivers of Ireland and Wales right up until the middle of the 20th century. People in Wales and Ireland frequently went out in their coracles and fished uh, and set shellfish traps and that sort of thing in coracles right the way up until the 50s, 60s, 70s. They were sort of semi-common. It's really died off now which is a shame but Hamish makes them. So I went and had to go in his coracle, because 
obviously I wanted to have a go in the coracle, and uh, I didn't fall in. Nearly fell in. Didn't fall in. So why am I making this video that is literally just what I did on my holidays this weekend? It's because I want you guys to see what's out there. I want you guys to see that there are amazing museums like the Scottish Cranock Centre, where you can go to events like the Celts are coming and see genuine, passionate experts in history. You think I'm passionate about the past? Wait till you get into a conversation with Hamish and the guys about leatherworking or about pigments. Did you know that you can make like five different colours of paint just from sand? Mind-blowing stuff that I learned this weekend. It's so cool. People are always asking me in the comments and even sort of in DMs and in messages, where do I go to learn more about the past and where do I go to learn more about this stuff? Museums and events are where you go to learn about things like this. So go to these little museums. Go to these places that have so many contacts and such a wonderful network of people. You don't get events like this at the British Museum. You don't get events like this at the Victoria and Albert Museum. You know, you get events like this at small local specialist museums that have spaces outside for craftspeople to just pitch a tent, do some dyeing, do some weaving, do some stonework, do some blacksmithing, do some natural pigment making, do some leather working, do some singing, making mead, sailing coracles, making raw, un, uh, making hand thrown pottery, you know? Layered pottery, coiled pottery, that's the one, coiled pottery, blowing a carnix as the sun goes down. And it's such an amazing experience. My plan for that day was to go there for like a couple of hours, say hello to my mates, and then go and have some dinner. I ended up staying there for six hours until it was dark. I was just having such a time. So especially now that things are starting to open up a little bit, really go out and enjoy these places. Go out and see what these museums and these little centres have to offer. Guaranteed you'll find something amazing. You will, if you're anything like me, develop six new hobbies. <laughs> Within about an hour, all of a sudden you'll want to do blacksmithing and tattooing and leatherworking and all of these other things. This is how you get into it. This is how you stir up that passion. And if you're a new reenactor and you're not sure if there's a specialism or a trade or a craft that you feel particularly drawn to, events like this are really useful because it can help you see what is really drawing you. You know, oh my god, but you know, making stuff out of fish skin. Hmm, maybe I do want to learn a new craft today. So there you go, that's all I wanted to do this video back for, was literally to talk about Cranogs for a minute and tell you about the Cranog Center. Um, go to the Cranog Center, donate to the Cranog Center, give them your hard-earned cash because they deserve it. They're doing amazing work. Most of the people who work there are locals and uh, really, really know the area and really know the subject and they're so, so passionate and they've got a dog and he's adorable. So help museums like this out. It's been such a tough couple of years for small museums. Thousands of them all across the world are struggling to stay open and stay afloat. So support your local museums, support the Cranog Centre, support me by joining my Patreon or giving me coffee money. <laughs> Haha, <laughs> I got it in. And as usual, Dilchumbaud Yaun, I'm a Minor. Thank you very, very much for joining me. And until the next time, who will I'm a drop? Bye for now.